Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president, and it's my great pleasure today to gather a distinguished group for a conversation with the IMF's first deputy managing director, David Lipton, on Ukraine. Um, as we've gotten on very short notice, thanks to David's schedule, which he generously adjusted to speak here, we've gotten a very distinguished crowd on short notice, and that reflects, obviously, David's role and the fund's role in the critical issues over Ukraine, um, the interest in this really important nexus of economic and national security issues, and as well, I hope, the Peterson Institute's ability to provide a good discussion as we draw on Anders Asland and Anna Gelpern uh, to help lead off comments on David's initial speech. More on them later. But first, just a word about David Lipton. Um, I was very effusive in my praise of David when he last spoke here. Uh, if I repeat it, he'll hit me. But basically, he has been at the core of international financial and economic policy for the last 25 years and has been an admirable public servant and leader in that for the last 25 years including his distinguished service prior to becoming first deputy managing director in 2011, as special assistant to the president, senior director for international economic affairs at the National Economic Council and National Security Council at the White House under President Obama, and of course as undersecretary of the Treasury for international affairs in the Clinton administration, along with his prior service at the IMF. He of course has extensive market experience with more capital management and was head of global country risk management at Citi from 2005 till he joined the Obama administration. Um, David, I think it's important to emphasize, is someone who sees the big picture. There's a famous episode of the TV show The West Wing, which some of you may remember, in which uh, the Martin Sheen character is instructing the Rob Lowe character on how to deal with a confrontation with the Chinese in the Straits. Thankfully, David's not worrying about that. But uh, they're sort of playing chess while talking it over, and Sheen keeps encouraging him to see what's really going on. And I think whether it's Russia and Ukraine and Eastern Europe, East Asia, the AAIB, or the great service that David did to the world, working with Richard Holbrook on the Balkan crisis, David always sees the big picture. And we're very grateful to have him with us today. Thank you. Morning, everyone, and thank you, Adam, for that embarrassingly kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here at uh, the Peterson Institute today. Uh, we always, we at the fund, always appreciate uh, your willingness to provide a place where we can come and have an informed discussion of important global issues, and that's what we aim to do today. Uh, with the spring meetings just around the corner. Uh, we're not going to talk about the global economy. We'll save that for another time, but rather our focus today is Ukraine. I'm uh, pleased to see that uh, so many of you are interested enough in the situation in Ukraine to get up this early in the morning. Uh, my reason for wanting to uh, come today and discuss this is that going into our spring meetings, uh, many will want to have a clear picture of the situation in that country as they seek to understand the risks that are facing the world and facing Europe in particular. I know that this audience is uh, fully aware of the importance that we at the IMF place on helping U Ukraine achieve financial stability and to return to growth. Just a little over a month ago, a little less than a month ago, time flies, uh, the fund approved a $17.5 billion uh, financing for Ukraine as part of a four-year program under our extended fund facility. The goals of that program are simple, uh, if challenging, to stabilize Ukraine's deeply destabilized finances, to restore growth that's been stagnant for several years, and to support the long overdue modernization that in Ukraine has lagged behind peers in the region since Ukraine achieved independence 23 years ago. Now, I know some have questioned 
the fund's decision to support Ukraine, including here in Washington, and have doubts about the government's commitment to reform after so many years of delay. So I'd like to lay out for you today what, what, what I think Ukraine faces, how the authorities are aiming to address the problems they have, and why the IMF stands with Ukraine at this time of economic crisis. I'll do that by addressing, uh, reviewing three themes. First, the uneven evolution of Ukraine's economic transformation since it achieved nationhood. How a set of serious but manageable economic difficulties descended into a full-blown crisis in the face of the confrontation in the country's eastern region. And Ukraine's response to that crisis, both the immediate efforts to stabilize the situation and its longer-term program to uh, restore growth and then transform the economy. So let's begin by reviewing how Ukraine reached the turning point that it faces. Ukraine generally only enters the global news cycle when it's the story of the day. There was independence in 1991, the Orange Revolution a little over a decade ago, the Maidan protests last year, and then the conflict with Russia. Of course, what happens when the world's not watching is often as important, and it's what we pay attention to. Sadly, Ukraine, since independence, has been a story of too many lost opportunities and too much disappointment, economic mismanagement, and half-hearted reforms that held back growth, corruption and oligarchy undermining the market economy, and episodes of voter fraud and abuse of power undercutting democracy. The comparison with uh, other, many other countries in Central and Eastern Europe is striking. Since 1991, Ukraine's had spurts of growth, but it's really not been able to reach a point where reforms took hold. Ukraine's per capita income at independence was higher than in Poland's in, in 2013. Uh, even before the crisis erupted, the standard of living had fallen 60% behind that of Poland. During this interval, Ukraine entered into eight IMF programs, none of which achieved the objective of prompting sustained reform. After the most recent program, uh, which ended unsuccessfully, Ukraine's macroeconomic problems intensified. For several years, wages and costs rose, but productivity didn't. And that had the effect eventually of eroding competitiveness, so much so that GDP stopped rising and exports stagnated. Budget imbalances and gas sector deficits widened enough to provide a significant drag on growth. But as I said, I think those problems at the time uh, were manageable and did not constitute crisis. In early 2013, I visited Kiev to urge the government to address these issues and warn that Ukraine was slipping toward crisis. We then had four or five visits from Ukrainian officials in the course of the remainder of 2013, up through when the protests began, to discuss whether they would uh, address those issues. Action then might have been possible without crisis and destabilization, but there wasn't the political will. Now Ukraine has the political will, but it has to contend with full-blown economic and financial crisis. And for the first time in a long time, a political window of opportunity has opened. The country has elected leaders who are approaching economic policy making with purpose and with commitment. Uh, they are uh, mobilized by the crisis situation. President Poroshenko and Prime Minister Yatsenyuk are in sync on the main economic issues. Uh, having a president and prime minister in Ukraine in sync in this way has not been the norm. And they can call on a more united political class and general public, now more ready to accept changes that they've resisted in the past. But since taking office, the government has faced a dangerous and rapidly deteriorating economic situation. Last year's sharp output decline 
was driven in large part by the loss of Crimea, the conflict in Donbass, and a deep recession elsewhere in the eastern part of the country. As a result, industrial production and construction, retail sales, household incomes have all fallen. Unemployment is approaching double digits. The uncertainty from the crisis has deterred investment. In the fourth quarter of 2014, the GDP was down 14.8% from a year earlier. Meanwhile, Ukraine's financing needs have surged. The conflict imposed direct costs, both in terms of output losses and budgetary deterioration. But there were also indirect costs as uncertainties hit the finances of banks and the finances of the public sector, and as the foreign exchange market became destabilized. Exports were hit hard by the disruption of trade with Russia and the low international prices for grains and steel, major Ukrainian exports. External private financing dried up and capital flows outflows accelerated. Foreign exchange reserves declined and the exchange rate depreciated sharply. The hryvnia lost two-thirds of its value in the past 15 months. Inflation spiked above 40%, reflecting the depreciation and the rising energy prices. The banking system has also come under extreme stress because of some fundamental weaknesses in key institutions, but also the general financial uncertainty. Deposits fell by 28% fell 28% by the end of March this year from uh, the beginning of this government's term. And non-performing loans soared to nearly 20% of all loans at the end of 2014. Profitability and liquidity were squeezed and several banks failed and were taken over. The government's tried to keep a lid on this very difficult situation. The budgets stayed within its 2014 deficit target Measures were taken to stabilize the banking system, and governance and structural reforms were initiated. But the escalation of the conflict in August 2014, and then again early this year, led to a significant loss of confidence and further disrupted economic activity. Despite gas price increases last year, the burden of supporting the state-owned energy monopoly, NAFTA gas, and funding energy subsidies equal to more than 7% of GDP, threatened to drown the government in red ink. So following this deterioration, late last year and early this year, it became increasingly clear to us and to Ukraine that their balance of payments and adjustment needs were more than could be uh, addressed uh, and under our original two-year standby agreement. Responding to the challenges, the government put together an impressive new reform blueprint, building on its existing macroeconomic program and extending its structural uh, reform effort. The IMF supported this with a new program approved by the, our executive board on March 11th. Now, from a financing standpoint, the objective of the program is to cover Ukraine's external financing needs which we estimated at about $40 billion over the next four years. While that's large, it's equal to about a third of Ukraine's 2014 GDP, most of it is already pledged by the international community, and the rest will take the form of a debt operation that's under discussion with creditors. This financing will in time help triple Ukraine's official reserves to about $18 billion at the end of this year from about uh, 5.6, from just 5.6 before we reached agreement with them. Reserves should then reach about $35 billion by the end of 2018, the end of our program, which is above the funds reserve adequacy metric. This will be an important boost to confidence and should help cushion the Ukrainian economy against shocks that it faces in the future. This is exactly where IMF financing, why um, IMF financing under the program is so important. Uh, we need to release that financing and help Ukraine find a path out of crisis. So let me say a little about the economic goals of this, of this program. The first critical goal 
is to just to stabilize Ukraine's finances. That began with the task of restoring stability to the foreign exchange market. By anchoring the program with an appropriately tight monetary target and with some temporary administrative measures, the Frivnia has been stabilized. Using a monetary anchor in this way is the same approach that's been used decisively during the Asian financial crisis and in other successful stabilizations. Recently, the drain on reserves has, reser has reversed. With the financing already pledged, reserve cover for imports uh, has risen. The U Ukraine announced yesterday that its uh, reserves now are just a little below 10 billion, having started at 5.6. And we think it's likely that with the funding that's uh, forthcoming, uh, reserve cover for imports will, will reach about three months imports by June, compared with just one month's imports at the end of last year. This will result from the, our, our disbursements and the bilateral loans and swaps that we, see, uh, that we see being arranged. In addition, a tight monetary stance supported by other policies will help inflation recede towards single digits by the end of 2016, once the one-off effects from the recent depreciation and from the gas price increases pass through and subside. Stabilization will also be supported by addressing the uncertainties that come from Ukraine's onerous external debt problem. The talks that the government's conducting with its creditors to restructure, exter to restructure external debt are aimed at that objective. Public and publicly guaranteed debt is projected to peak at 94% of GDP this year. The aim of the restructuring would be to secure $15 billion in additional financing over 2015 to 2018 and bring the debt below 71% of GDP by 2020 and as well avoid bunching of repayments once the fund program uh, has completed. So stabilization is the first goal, but it's not enough to address Ukraine's problems. Ukraine also needs to restore growth. The crucial challenge is to restore the competitiveness that was undermined by an overvalued exchange rate and wages that grew in excessive productivity. The combination of the exchange rate depreciation we've seen and the flexibility uh, that uh, the Frivnia is now uh, uh, has, uh, we think that's an important step. It's creating a basis for Ukrainian businesses once again to compete on international markets. Similarly, the, the spending constraints built into Ukraine's program should help reduce deficits that had been crowding out the private sector. And that means both the, the, the public sector's direct deficit and the quasi-fiscal deficit that comes from the losses in NAFTA gas. Those steps are essential to restoring competitiveness. Here, action on energy prices has been essential. As I've indicated, the government has significantly increased household gas prices and heating tariffs. The, a round of increases took effect uh, April 1. This is important because Ukraine's gas prices have stood at or below 20% of cost recovery. So, and that's well below the other countries in the region, the peers of, of Ukraine in the region. The remaining 80% of those costs has become part of the broad public sector deficit. But with the, with the uh, uh, reform of gas pricing, uh, that problem will now come to an end. To keep uh, this reform from hurting vulnerable members of society, new and strengthened targeted programs are being put in place. The final step to restoring growth is to bring the banking system back to health. The government's working to resolve insolvent banks, including through recapitalization and, where necessary, liquidation. Quite a number of banks have already been liquidated. Recapitalization needs are provided for in the financial programming and architecture uh, of the IMF arrangement. Going forward, the government will also see that large financial institutions are kept well capitalized by their owners. All of this should help to reopen the TAPs and provide uh, sufficient levels of credit 
to the business community and consumers, although this will probably take some time to accomplish. These are all important measures that need to be put in place this year. But there are longer term challenges if Ukraine's going to achieve the ultimate goal of the program, sustained growth into the future, and reach a level of development that's on par with its more successful neighbors. These are the structural reforms needed to create a modern economy that can give renewed confidence to a business community and a general public and attract the kind of investment that will be supportive of growth. For example, there are key structural impediments in the banking system. These include an ownership structure that too often funnels excessive lending to insiders, often with sweetheart deals. The government's starting to address this issue with a strengthened regulatory and supervisory framework that's intended to bring the banking system into line with international best practices. There's also a set of needed reforms to affect the business climate. Key policy measures in these areas re relate basically to governance, deregulation and reform of tax administration, transparency, reforms of state-owned enterprises. All of those things are uh, provided for in this program, although the work is just beginning. Central to this effort will be an independent audit of NAFTA gas, the state gas company's receivables, and a restructuring of that company to separate its transmission and its distribution arms. Finally, nothing is more important in the area of structural reform than a commitment to tackle corruption. As much as any other grievance, it was this problem that brought Ukrainian people into the streets during the Maidan protests. The government's addressing this problem with a strengthened anti, with strengthened anti-corruption legislation, the creation of an anti-corruption commission, measures to enhance the effectiveness of the judiciary, and efforts to control corruption in Ukraine's police force. It's also worth noting that uh, recent steps uh, have been taken to curb the influence of some of the powerful oligarchs. This is an expansive and a complex reform effort. Clearly, it'll take time to, to, and, and a lot of effort and political strength to achieve. Uh, it's inevitable that questions will arise about whether this agenda will carry on and whether it will continue to have the support of the Ukrainian people particularly those who are and, uh, most affected by uh, the economic crisis. But I think we should all be impressed that the government has uh, embarked on this effort and that it's, as it does so, it's taking steps to address the needs of the most vulnerable people in society. Total spending on social assistance programs will reach about 4.1% of GDP this year. That's an increase of 30% in the resources dedicated to this. Uh, they'll give assistance with uh, energy bills, uh, which is more important in the face of the price liberalization they're undertaking. The assistance uh, on energy bills will quadruple from 6 billion rivnia to 24 billion this year, 6 billion last year to 24 billion this year. Unemployment benefits will rise by 15%. Uh, finding ways to do means-tested support in the place of blanket subsidies is an important part of uh, sustaining uh, the reform effort and maintaining political uh, support. So what about the risks? Uh, we, of course, can't gloss over the situation on the ground in Ukraine. If the conflict in the east part of the country int intensifies, and we certainly hope it, it, won't, it will not, then one would surely have to be concerned about the sustainability of uh, uh, this expected recovery. So we can really only urge Ukraine, Russia, and Ukraine's other partners to work together on the peace process and bring it to a satisfactory uh, end. Here in Washington, we're already hearing from critics who question the wisdom of supposedly putting fund resources at risk in such an uncertain situation. But of course, we have only one answer, the answer that it's the fund's job to support members in crisis, provided that they're trying to put themselves right. That goal, for
for Ukraine may be a hard one, but I think it's not an unrealistic one. To achieve it, Ukraine must pursue its reform program, and the international community must continue to support that effort. The government has a good plan, the right plan, and it has determination to follow through. Their program has the backing of the Ukrainian people, so I think it's the right thing to do for all of us to stand with them. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, David. It's not just the big picture, it may indeed be the right picture, and it's certainly a trenchant and brave set of dealing with the issues we're all facing and where the fund is having to make very difficult choices. Thank you for being so forthright and clear. I'm now going to ask our colleague Anders Aslan to join us. Before he stands up, let me complete the advertising. Um, Anders' new book, Ukraine, what Went Wrong and How to Fix It, which I think may have had some informing influence on, on David and the Fund in its previous iterations, will be released a week from Friday here in this room. Um, and we will be having the Ukrainian Finance Minister Jeresko and the Economy Minister, whose name I forget, Abaromichus, um, to join Anders in the uh, release of his book. And I encourage you all to watch online or join us here in, in a week from Friday on April 17th. The flyer is out. The book is available for purchase online in pre-advanced copy. Um, the fact that we're publishing Anders' book on Ukraine is testament to the fact that Anders is one of the leading, if not the leading, Western scholar on the Ukrainian economy, as well as, of course, on Russia and Eastern Europe and the economics of transition more broadly. He's now been at the Institute for nine years, previously worked at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace at Brookings, had been an economic advisor to the government of Russia in 91 to 94, and Ukraine in 94 to 97. He's, of course, been a more informal, very senior advisor to the better of the Ukrainian governments in the past and to the current Ukrainian government. And um, he and Simeon Jankov published with us last fall a major work on the great rebirth, on uh, the transformation in Eastern Europe with a particular focus on drawing lessons for why it hadn't yet worked in Ukraine. Obviously, the fund's role, all of our role in the West is critical to whether it will work. So Anders, if you could give us some brief response to David's remarks. Oh, thank you very much, Adam, for these very kind words. I uh, blush immediately <laughs> and prolongedly. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate the IMF, David, Nikolai, and uh, uh, most of all the Ukrainian government upon this program. I think that this is exactly what Ukraine needs. And listening here to David, uh, my problem right now is that uh, I don't disagree on any point. So what I will discuss is more uh, what, uh, how to draw it out. A year ago, the IMF presented a, a program, and I had three serious objections to it. The first was that uh, it was too little fiscal adjustment, 2% of GDP over uh, uh, two years. This is a much more substantial program in terms of fiscal adjustment. The second was that the structural reforms that were there were not going far enough. As uh, David so well elaborated upon, this goes much further. And uh, uh, as David did, I would emphasize one thing, the gas price. The gas price in the program last year increased by 56%. It might sound a lot, but if the gas price is one-tenth of the market price, it's not. So in, uh, on the 1st of April, the Ukrainian government increased the gas price for household by 330%. And you didn't hear about it because there was no sign of a protest. The Ukrainian government uh, 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 and the population understand that this is necessary. Therefore, nobody protested. And they know 
that the much of a difference. The government subsidies have gone to oligarchs. The way of making a fortune in Ukraine for the last two decades has been to buy cheap gas from Gazprom, sell it at a market price in Ukraine, and uh, that's how you make a fortune. And on top of that, uh, the difference has been funded in various ways by the Ukrainian government. This should not be the case. And this is the biggest step so far we have seen uh, a against that. And then there are a lot of other structural reforms, deregulation, doing away with certification and, and uh, uh, permits. Uh, uh, and this is happening on a broad front. What uh, the third issue is funding. And here is my main concern. I think that the IMF is doing its part with $17.5 billion of funding, and uh, fortunately this is front-loaded. But as far as I can see, we are seeing about $8 billion that is coming online in real funding. $2 billion of loan guarantees from the US, $1.9 billion uh, from the European uh, Union, various um, bilateral support, about $2 billion, and uh, the World Bank and some other multilateral support, $2 billion. This is too little. And this is my big question to uh, David here. What more can come on to the table? You, uh, uh, the Ukrainian government, are holding now a fundraising meeting, a donor meeting, in Kiev on the 28th of April. What do you think should come out of it? And what do you think really can uh, come out of this? With regards to the risks, uh, let me just say three things here. Russian aggression is, of course, the big risk. There are strong uh, rumors that there will be a Russian offensive after Orthodox Christmas, uh, Easter, that is next week to celebrate the victory uh, uh, <clears throat> in Mariupol on the 9th of May. This is the big danger. And uh, clearly the military preparations are being undertaken. It's not clear that the attack will uh, actually uh, happen. The second risk is too little funding that I've just uh, uh, talked about. And then the third risk that uh, David touched upon, but perhaps I should say something more, is that the economic problems are simply too great. Uh, as we speak, uh, the inflation in Ukraine year over year in March was 46%. The reserves have now doubled uh, up to almost $10 billion, but that's too little. The IMF funding salvaged Ukraine from a financial meltdown, which was actually the situation 23rd to 25th of February. And uh, uh, the situation is truly precarious. And then to have a war on top of that in this uh, situation. So for example, if Mariupol would fall, that's about one third of Ukraine's exports. Uh, <clears throat> grain and steel that go through uh, the port of uh, Mariupol. Uh, a fourth issue that I don't put up as a risk is too little reforms. That has been the dominant risk throughout Ukraine's post-Soviet uh, uh, period. This government is sufficiently committed so that uh, they are truly try trying to do so. I've worked with uh, or have contact with all the uh, governments uh, since 91. And uh, there's no comparison. Th these are the 38-year-old investment bankers who are coming in to clean up uh, a government who knew how to do things, not necessarily government, but how to run organizations. And uh, this is the, the big hope. The uh, hope has never been bigger, but also the problems have not been this big since 94. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes you want a discussant who uh, agrees, if only to emphasize and amplify. 
And as you know, Anders doesn't always agree with the people he discusses, so I hope you'll take that as a very credible uh, commitment. I'd now like to turn to our colleague Anna Gelpern, who is a non-resident senior fellow here at the Peterson Institute, is also a professor of law at Georgetown University. She's held faculty appointments at a number of distinguished law schools, including Rutgers Law Newark and George Washington, and a visiting scholar at visiting professorship at Harvard Law and University of Penn. Um, she had previously, of course, worked as an advisor in the Clinton era Treasury Department. Um, and most importantly for us, as in addition to being a great colleague, is at this unique nexus of law and economics and international debt in a very practical way. And I think no one is as influential and thoughtful about how those issues come together as Anna Gelpern, and we're very proud to have her affiliated with the Institute. So Anna, please. Thank you, Adam. That was incredibly generous. Um, you seem to be ramping up the generous, and it's, I'm blushing like the rest. Um, it is a privilege uh, to be here uh, to follow Anders and especially to comment on David, since I consider David to be uh, a mentor. And I think he, I, I swear, I first started thinking about collective action clauses and David's presence. So in some sense, he's responsible for my entire trajectory. So it's great to be here. And thank you for this opportunity. Now, um, apropos debt restructuring and uh, sovereign debt contracts, um, David mentioned the importance of the debt operation to Ukraine's program. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time just talking about that. Uh, depending on how you count, the operation uh, is the second largest source of financing for the program after the fund itself. Um, which gives you a sense of uh, the uh, importance uh, of debt restructuring in this program. Um, and it is also because of the unique features of Ukrainian uh, debt and the policy environment, uh, as well as the political environment, um, likely to be one of the most challenging debt restructurings uh, in uh, recent memory. Now, I think we say that about every debt restructuring that comes up. That's the nature of the business, but I think the problems here are truly unique, and I'd like to spend a little time talking about them. Um, so first of all, the task ahead. Um, as David mentioned, uh, there is a, a, uh, the need to get about $15 billion in flow relief over the program period to get the debt to GDP uh, ratio down to under 71 percent by 2020, and then to uh, avoid bunching, as he said, to have an average budget shortfall of uh, 10 percent of GDP and no more than 12 percent uh, each year. Now, that actually, even by the standards of uh, the IMF's uh, sort of setting the restructuring envelope, is a fairly prescriptive set of parameters. Um, uh, and. Uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of wiggle room, particularly if you consider expectations for annual flow relief that are also in the program document, including over $5 billion this year alone. Um, all of this uh, is supposed to be achieved in a restructuring operation that is done in um, less than three months' time. Uh, so again, this is truly daunting. Um, Ukraine recently announced that it will only restructure debts uh, that, it were, that it incurred before February 2014, so there's a cutoff date, um, which of course is sensible. This is the uh, advent of the new government, but it also uh, kind of points to a limited universe of debt available for restructuring. It also said that it will only change the maturity for debt owned, owed by state-owned banks, again, um, constraining the options for the rest. Um, so what are the complications to this already daunting task? Well, first of all, special complication number one, and the IMF program document is very forthright about this, um, uh, there's an assumption of near total creditor participation against the background of very large uh, blocks uh, of debt held by uh, single creditors. So 
depending on how you count, a quarter or a third or a half, um, may be held by a single creditor, certainly more than enough for blocking positions in um, many, if not most, of the uh, private debt instruments involved. Um, now, depending on how you look at this, either there is no collective action problem, you know who the creditors are, you know where to call them, or this is the mother of all collective action problems because, of course, the restructuring cannot be done without the participation of these large creditors holding blocking positions. Um, traditional contractual tools for overcoming collective action problems among creditors are pretty well irrelevant in this setting because they're premised on this idea of having lots of dispersed small bondholders that need to be corralled together. This is not the case here, again. So uh, to the extent folks are looking at collective action clauses, I think that is probably not worth a whole lot of time. It's worth some, but uh, there are enough blocking positions in enough hands to um, uh, uh, essentially neutralize these clauses in the restructuring. There are other tools, but uh, this is not uh, the path of greatest hope. Now, special complication number two, um, beyond uh, the high concentration of uh, holdings and the expectation of high participation, is this much talked about Russian Eurobond bought by the Russian Sovereign Wealth Fund at the end of 2013. Um, likely in contravention of its own investment guidelines and maturing at the end of this year. That's $3 billion, um, coincidentally the same as the uh, all uh, U.S. guarantees uh, extended uh, for Ukraine to issue new bonds uh, and, you know, three out of the $5 billion uh, of relief that might be expected this year. Um, now, that means there's a creditor with very different motives and very different leverage, uh, both legal, political, and security, not to mention gas, in the mix. And there has been a huge amount of hand-wringing about whether Russia and the Russian Eurobond should be classified as a private obligation or as an official obligation. Um, and to my mind, this hand-wringing kind of misses the point because the instrument was designed very deliberately and very well um, to be both official and private, right? To be official for some purposes, private for others, um, and essentially to have it multiple ways. Now this was, uh, again, quite ingenious, um, and I think that what it means is that, for example, it uh, might be, as uh, some official statements suggest, um, official debt for purposes of IMF lending into arrears policy, but private debt for purposes, for other purposes, for purposes, for example, of going to the Paris Club. Um, what this means is that uh, there are multiple iterations of the conversation over this bond, and that at every turn it may look different, and the onus is on other creditors and funders um, to figure out how to position themselves vis-a-vis -vis this uh, $3 billion uh, obligation, um, again, in different policy settings. Um, special complication number three, the last one is, um, unfortunately, Ukraine's restructuring comes at a time when the IMF's own policies on sovereign debt restructuring are in transition. Um, you may recall the conversation about um, expanding the range of restructuring outcomes uh, to reflect uncertainty in debt sustainability analysis that we've had for the last couple of years. So this conversation about reprofiling if and uh, it is not certain that uh, the country's debt would be sustainable with high probability. Um, now, the problem with this is that when this conversation began, Ukraine was actually an ideal candidate for this soft restructuring and reprofiling, and that may have created certain expectations that uh, were disappointed when uh, the program document came out, uh, and when it turned out that Ukraine's debt is not sustainable under uh, uh, most realistic assumptions, uh, and therefore a restructuring is necessary. Now, the problem is now we're at risk of getting confused 
uh, among the meanings of restructuring, uh, debt operation, reprofiling. The bottom line is that Ukraine's debt needs to be reduced, and uh, you know, it is being done under the old policy, right? Um, and uh, the restructuring will proceed as many have done in the past in an ad hoc manner. In addition, of course, the policy on lending into arrears uh, is also under discussion, uh, and therefore whether Ukraine's non-payment to Russia would somehow interfere with the IMF's uh, financing is another question up in the air. Now, honestly, like everybody else, I think it'll all work out. I think that there's plenty of room for optimism. I think that there's plenty of room for interpretation. Um, but I think that given the importance of the debt operation, we should not underestimate the challenges ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I, I didn't mean to make everyone blush. I just sincerely am excited that we have, I think, the best people here today for the appropriate discussion. But we also have many of the good people in the audience as well. And so now we're going to open it up for On the Record Exchange. If I could invite our three speakers, David, Anders, and Anna, to come up, and we'll take it from there. Um, Uh, as always, I, I'm going to ask that we allow the first couple questions to go to our outside guests and not to other PIE fellows since we already had two PIE fellows speak. Um, there is a traveling mic in Jessica's hand up front. There is a standing mic at back if it's easier for you to go that. Uh, just raise your hand to be recognized and put a question to David or any of our panelists. Yeah, please. So this gentleman here, and if you could go to the back mic directly behind you. Please identify yourself, if you would. Hi, my name is Andrei Sitov. I'm uh, with the Russian news agency, uh, TASS, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask Mr. Lipton to comment on uh, Anna's presentation and her optimism. Uh, I uh, do hope, like everybody else, that uh, all the issues are resolved and there is peace in Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, but the question of the debt still uh, lingers, so I'd, I'd like to ask Mr. Lipton to comment on uh, how the IMF uh, views the prospects for its resolution. And uh, secondly, there is a uh, uh, new report suggesting that uh, the uh, drop in the uh, Ukrainian economy uh, this quarter, the latest quarter, the first quarter of this year, is comparable to the one that you cited, to 15%. Uh, so how can that reflect on the program? Thank you. Well, let me start with your second question. I think it's just uh, uh, too soon for the program to uh, be generating a restoration of growth. The point I made in my talk was that the first objective, chronologically the first objective of the program is to stabilize the finances uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we know that the uh, exchange rate uh, situation was very dire uh, because of generalized uncertainty and the low level of reserves and the various ways that I described in my talk. I think the, the, the a set of policies and some financing has been put in place to stabilize uh, the, the, the situation. Already the currency has stabilized. It is now uh, time to turn to uh, the restoration of growth, but I think we acknowledge and, and I laid out there and as well the uh, steps that are uh, uh, underway, uh, that are planned, uh, that will uh, support a restoration of growth, but we acknowledge that that will take some time. On the debt uh, operation, uh, there's only so much that I can say because the fund's role is by definition limited. We have laid out important parameters that Ukraine needs from a financing standpoint, $15 billion worth of funding. That is a flow concept. We have laid out that we believe that the debt uh, should be brought to 71% of GDP. Uh, we've laid out what the uh, debt service uh, to GDP uh, uh, should be in the years beyond the fund program. Uh, it's then in the, in the, really in the court of uh, debtors and creditors, in this case Ukraine and its bond creditors, to uh, 
uh, have the discussions and sort it out. Those discussions are, as Anna said, uh, going to be complex. Uh, as she said, every uh, debt negotiation has its own uh, features and peculiarities, and she addressed uh, the uh, pattern of bond holdings uh, in this case. Uh, this will take time. It's just begun. Um, as is always the case, debtor and creditors uh, uh, negotiate against the backdrop of the realities of the country. The country is, has a crisis. The country is taking steps to over, over, overcome uh, the crisis. Uh, it is engaged in a program with us. Uh, the, the negotiations will take place against that backdrop. And uh, uh, in the end of the day, uh, the debtor and the creditors will have to come to some, uh, to some resolution that is, uh, that is satisfactory. At the back mic, and then the gentleman over there. Hi, um, this is Anna Yukonan of with Reuters. Uh, thanks for the presentation that covered a lot of the key issues. I just wanted to uh, follow up on the debt restructuring and about the timing. Um, do you think there is a particular need for Ukraine to get this done by the time of the next IMF review in June? And if it doesn't, are, what are the implications for uh, Ukraine's finances? And maybe if others want to address that. And also, if you could address um, Anders Uslan's question about further donor financing. Um, what do you expect to come from the conference at the end of this month? Or what other needs does Ukraine have over the next years of the IMF program? Thank you. Thanks. Good questions. Um, well, Ukraine is engaged in, uh, in these discussions. The finance minister has made a round of uh, visits to discuss uh, the debt operation with creditors. I think, uh, you know, they are working with their advisors and lawyers. I think they have a fairly rapid timetable for the development of uh, some kind of operation. We have in our program uh, that we will take a look at the progress towards uh, the uh, conclusion of a debt operation when we review the program next and uh, that uh, the progress on uh, the debt operation will be an important, uh, an important consideration as we take up that review. Uh, you know, that kind of architecture is common in fund programs, and it is meant uh, to provide uh, an incentive for debtors and creditors to get on with uh, important, the important business of s seeking suitable financing assurances. Uh, to give, and but yet to give, uh, to make sure that there's a level playing field uh, for those conversations. On uh, this, on the financing, um, you know, the, the the 40 billion dollars is what we see as Ukraine's needs for the four-year period, and what we see as consistent with the debt profile, uh, looking at how it goes forward. So we're not looking for Ukraine to borrow more money to spend more and be more heavily indebted. We're looking for the $40 billion of financing. We think that, uh, you know, we've put forward the $17.5 billion that will be our part of uh, this. Anders mentioned the bilateral monies, which he put at $8 billion, which puts you, if that's right, in the neighborhood of 25 plus uh, 15 more for the debt operation would get, you, would, would get you there. So obviously, four years is a long time. The way things uh, un unfold uh, is uncertain. Um, whether 40 is exactly the right number or not, uh, we will always we'll be assessing at each uh, at each review. Uh, that said, that does not mean Ukraine doesn't wouldn't benefit from a couple of kinds of additional financing. And let me go through and say what I mean by that. If there are others who wish to provide financing to Ukraine that Ukraine can uh, use to have a more rapid restoration of its international reserves, that would be useful. And in fact, some of that has happened, and some of that is under further discussion. The Chinese government, the Chinese Central Bank, excuse me, the People's Bank of China, has uh, concluded with the, the National Bank of Ukraine uh, a swap arrangement that totals 15 billion rivni, or roughly 2.4 billion dollars. That swap arrangement was not envisioned 
in our program. It is now in place. And that's one of the reasons why I'm suggesting that while reserves were roughly a month of imports when the program started and with our disbursement are roughly two months of imports, that it's likely to reach three months of imports by uh, June. That's because the, the, um, the, you, the Chinese central bank swap is in place and there are swaps from two or possibly three other countries that are under discussion, which could also help augment Ukraine's reserves. Now, you know, these swaps are uh, inherently short-term in nature, but they are a way of uh, having a more rapid, I described to you the programmed rise in reserves over the four-year period of the fund arrangement, but if uh, reserves can be boosted more quickly uh, through these swaps, I think it does provide uh, a measure of um, uh, safety and protection that given the uncertainties uh, uh, that Ukraine faces, both economic and security uncertainties, could be uh, really very valuable. Uh, you know, if, uh, if there are uh, other sources of finance uh, that come from a, a, an inter a donor conference or interaction between Ukraine and friendly countries, if it is, uh, you know, if there's, if there's concessional elements that's good. If there's financing that can support a more rapid accumulation of reserves, that too uh, would be a welcomed margin of safety. Um, Anders or Anna, do you want to add anything on this point? Uh, just on the debt front, I think that if, um, uh, I mean, there's a certain amount of inevitable hydraulics, right? So that uh, if you must have it sooner, um, then you're, gonna, you're more likely to see default before restructuring. You're more likely to see aggressive legal tactics. Um, at the same time, uh, and others have pointed it out, if you have holdouts, that means others have to give more, whether it's in new money or in uh, you know, concessions in a restructuring. So um, I think that this will be a um, kind of punctuated, a pretty bumpy ride, um, but the reality is the country doesn't have enough money to pay all of its debts. Okay, uh, the gentleman here and then at the back mic. Uh, thank you for your presentations. I'm Qi Hang Zheng from Xinhua News Agencies. Um, uh, because uh, Russia is the largest trade partner of Ukraine, uh, so uh, my question is that uh, Mm, now, what's the attitude of Russian? Is Russian uh, want to help Ukraine to get out of the current economic crisis? That is my first question. And my second question is that uh, how much the economic relationship between Russia and Ukraine have been affected since the crisis broke out last year? Thank you. Let me uh, speak about the economic aspect of the relationship. Uh, it is the case that trade between Russia and Ukraine is sharply decreased. Let me just explain the general uh, trade pattern that Ukraine has. Ukraine has about 20% uh, uh, of GDP that are exports. It's roughly 10% of GDP is exported to Europe and the West. 10% of GDP is exported to, in the past, before the crisis, towards, uh, to uh, Russia. And geographically, much of what is exported to Russia is either mined or manufactured in the eastern part of the country. The, uh, that 10 percent, of course, employs a lot of people in eastern Ukraine. And it's that 10 percent of GDP that has declined very sharply, uh, uh, probably by last, last data I saw in the neighborhood of 40 percent uh, decline. Now, there are various reasons why uh, this has happened. Some have to do with the fact that some of the exports are uh, military or dual-use goods, and uh, <coughs> Ukraine uh, understandably has decided not to be uh, exporting those categories of goods to Russia uh, under the present circumstances. Uh, there, there are, in addition, trade obstacles that have been put in place by both sides. Our view as, I mean, let me say two things. We have had an active discussion with Russia and Ukraine about uh, the, the trade between the two countries and what might be done 
uh, to restore it. Uh, both sides cooperate and, and are, are uh, open to, to those discussions. And more generally, I would say the IMF, you know, Russia is a member of the IMF. We have very uh, straightforward and regular uh, dialogue with Russia about uh, the Ukrainian economic situation. And uh, we have found that they've been uh, quite uh, open to having these kinds of, uh, these kinds of uh, conversations. Yeah, let me add a little uh, a bit on this. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and to start with uh, the trade, in 2013, 24% of Ukraine's exports went to Russia. Uh, last year, these exports fell by half. So Ukraine was deprived of 12% of its exports. By and large, these could not be sent to any other country. So the composition of uh, uh, trade, as uh, David said, it's predominantly arms. 34% of Ukraine's exports to Russia was machinery, and that's essentially arms, uh, a little bit of railway equipment. And um, Ukraine is very important for Russia's military industrial complex because Ukraine does not have its own military industrial complex. It's part of the old Soviet military industrial complex. So for example, Motor Sich in uh, Saporosha produces all Russian helicopter engines. Russia cannot produce one helicopter without Ukrainian helicopter engines. And this trade has continued because this is not considered military, but dual technology. Uh, similar, uh, all uh, ballistic uh, m uh, rockets are produced in, um, the, the big ones are produced in Dnipropetrovsk. Uh, 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 lots of uh, radar equipment parts uh, is produced in Kharkiv. Uh, naval ships in uh, Nikolaevsk on the Black Sea and uh, Antonov military transport planes essentially produced uh, in Kiev. So uh, 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 <clears throat> the Russian military industrial complex is very weak without uh, uh, Ukraine. What has happened is that the Russian government has undertaken highly personalized uh, sanctions against, for example, two oligarchs producing steel pipes, two pro-European, we can't have them, therefore their exports to Russia have been prohibited. President Poroshenko himself has uh, suffered because uh, uh, his chocolate were uh, sold to Russia to a considerable extent. And of course, they don't have a proper sanitary standard. So they, they have been blocked. Most of agricultural production in Ukraine has been blocked to Russia. So it's steel pipes and uh, agriculture, which are two big uh, export items to, uh, to Russia, which have been blocked while uh, the, what is happening in, on the military side is very dubious. We can see on the enterprise reports that they are continuing to sell, while the official policy is that this, uh, 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 these exports uh, have stopped. So what we're seeing is massive trade sanctions from Russia in order to hurt Ukraine. Similar attitude in, in the area of gas, where Russia persistently has pursued uh, two aims, one, to corrupt Ukraine through corrupt gas deals, and the second, uh, to squeeze uh, uh, un unpleasant Ukrainian politicians. Uh, Gazprom's pricing uh, policy is completely discriminatory, which the European Commission uh, is now attacking and will hopefully do in a, a systematic fashion. And then we have what uh, Anna discussed, uh, the financial issue, which is quite uh, un uh, unclear, and we have a war. So what Russia is pursuing is what they call a hybrid war, using all kinds of means to attack uh, Ukraine. There's no sign of co cooperation in this. Thank you. Lovely. Um, Ted, please. Ted Truman from the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Very interesting discussion. I'd like to take us back to the uh, debt issue and ask two questions, one of which has sort of been asked before, but maybe I can get a slightly stronger answer, David. Uh, uh, you do have in their program, you do have this uh, uh, 
target for having a, the a, a deal uh, in time for the first review in approximately June. Uh, the question is whether, whether if this thing drags on, then that becomes a problem in itself in the program because you would not have achieved uh, sufficient uh, financing uh, uh, in, in time. Uh, so how that, how a delay would affect the program and you're thinking about the financing. The broader, more philosophical question is to what extent you see the approach to the uh, uh, Ukrainian program as, uh, as a model for how one should, how the fund might approach, uh, should approach, might approach uh, uh, exceptional access programs in the future. It is done under, essentially under the old policy uh, for such program in which you've essentially forced a restructuring as part of a, a program, uh, expanded access program. It involves potentially, anyhow, some reprofiling. Uh, do you see this, therefore, as a test of uh, going back to the, uh, the policy as it was before? or is it more sui generis? Thank you. Thanks. Um, you know, we, we will, uh, at the time of the review of the whole program, we will look at how uh, much progress there's been made on the debt operation. And as I said, that will be a consideration in our review, but we're not, uh, we're not um, uh, explicit. It do, we, we do not have an explicit particular decision to make at that point. We have a fair amount of leeway in how we judge uh, the progress at that point. It would be best if Ukraine and its creditors can reach uh, agreement by that point. Uh, it will be a consideration in our review. Uh, I'll say as a general matter, there always is a point, and I'm not sure whether it's in this case when that, when that comes, whether it's at the f first review or not. We will have to determine that. But uh, a decision has to be made about whether the um, financing that's assumed in the program is forthcoming. And, uh, you know, we, we have many options. We have various ways to go forward, ways to, to uh, operate once we've made that determination. We hope to be able to make it in June, but if we can't make it in June, uh, we will uh, uh, figure out in June how to go forward. The point of this approach is to uh, provide an incentive for debtor and creditors to reach agreement. Uh, we, they, they, they understand our lending framework. They understand the various paths forward. They negotiate against, they have seen the parameters that we've put forward that we will use to judge the operation. Uh, they will negotiate against that backdrop. On uh, your philosophical question, um, I don't think that the um, Ukrainian case engages the major issues that are under discussion in our review of our uh, sovereign debt restructuring lending framework. Uh, there are, you know, one issue that's being discussed is whether the existing uh, uh, systemic exemption, uh, the systemic exemption that has been used in the case of some of the European countries, that has to do with whether uh, there's potential contagion uh, that's systemically uh, important. That's not uh, the issue in this case. Um, second, uh, in this case, we did uh, build into the program a debt operation because we felt that was uh, going to be necessary for uh, Ukraine's debt to be uh, sustainable with high probability. Um, and I think that's something, that's an option that we have under our present set of rules and procedures. And it's one that we will have once we've completed the, uh, the review of our lending framework. Uh, as you, many of you know, and, and as uh, Anna um, mentioned in her remarks, we are considering whether to broaden the toolkit that we use in a situation where a country um, uh, has, uh, is, is being um, 
where the fund is considering exceptional access, meaning a large financing program, and where uh, we believe that a country's s uh, sustainability prospects are in a gray zone, where we might consider uh, adding to the toolkit a reprofiling, a reschedule, a, re a, a reprofiling of debt for a short period of time to create a breathing space in order to see whether gray is in fact yellow or gray is in fact um, uh, red. Uh, but that's not the situation uh, either for Ukraine. We decided that this debt operation was, um, uh, that was necessary was something significantly more than the kind of reprofiling that we will be talking about in our new, in our new policy. Um, just an operational note, David's been very forthcoming and obviously is competent to talk about all of this, but I would like to keep the focus of this event primarily on Ukraine. On our website, there's an event we held about two, three weeks ago with Seth Hagen from the fund talking about some of these new issues, and I welcome people to go back and take a look at that, and we will obviously revisit this issue in future. Uh, the gentleman at the mic. Alex Yanevsky, Voice of America, Ukrainian Service. Uh, Mr. Lipton, I have two questions. Uh, number one is, Ukraine has a long story of incredibly corrupted country due to the history. And uh, you said that it was eight IMF programs uh, so far, and all of them pretty much failed. My question is, uh, how are you going to track money so we do not see a new mansions raising all over the country? and no IMF um, uh, money, let's say, resides uh, in offshore zones. And question number two would be, uh, if Ukraine fails as a state due to the Russian aggression, what's your next step regarding the money? <laughs> how are you going to get money back? And uh, what's your plan? Thank you. First, I want to correct uh, part of your premise. I said that uh, through the eight programs, they had not prompted sustained reform. There were successes and there were failures along the way in those programs in terms of their immediate objectives. I was drawing a more summary judgment uh, than I think you made. Um, you know, fighting corruption in, uh, in uh, countries that are engaged in fund programs has always been and I think will always be a difficult uh, bit. We can't, um, because money is fungible, we can't, uh, in essence, any, any, uh, any corruption anywhere in a country uh, that happens during an IMF program is something that we can't approve of. But then again, it's something that we can't eradicate 100 percent. I think that the, the, uh, what is important in this program is that the government uh, knowing and even uh, f uh, you know, fully openly admitting that corruption is a problem in Ukraine is beginning to face it in a more uh, direct and square fashion than predecessor uh, governments. Please, uh, I, I would urge you to take a look at what they're doing specifically at the anti-corruption legislation, at the, uh, the anti-corruption um, uh, agency that they're creating uh, in time in the work that they're doing uh, to enforce uh, the laws that they have. Uh, you know, we do have benchmarks in our program that, uh, that uh, will, as best we can, try to gauge the progress in these areas. Uh, and we do consider it uh, very important. It is one of the subjects that we will have to make judgments about along the way. But as I say, the good news is that this is a government that is admitting and squarely taking on uh, the issue. Um, you know, our, the reason that uh, the IMF exists is to help countries, member countries that have crises, that have problems. Um, it's one of, the, one of our core mandates. And uh, that's to make sh to try to in help countries uh, succeed rather than fail. We have uh, helped. We have in the past, uh, when countries have failed, we have gone in and helped them after after there's been uh, uh, various forms of failure. Um, but you know, I think our immediate efforts right now are to 
help Ukraine move in, the, in a healthy direction and avoid the, the, the really important and I think quite significant downside risks that they face. Do either the panelists want to add anything on this? Okay. At the mic. Um, Bill Klein here at the Institute. Um, I wonder if you would go into some of the tricks of figuring out solvency versus liquidity in this situation. To begin with, the debt owed to Russia, it seems to me, falls under a category where, since the Russians apparently did have a contract to pay $40 billion for rental of Crimea Naval Base. It would seem to me there is some basis for considering this to be a, an area of uh, financial obligation dispute and that a protracted moratorium on debt owed to Russia would be uh, justifiable until there is a peace settlement and that it would not be particularly appropriate for the international community to treat that as uh, default triggering default clauses and so forth. So that's special. I understand that a lot of the debt is held by the central bank. Well, that's interesting because the central bank declares profits to the fiscal uh, on its debt earnings. It certainly does in the United States. It's helped the U.S. budget. Uh, so uh, that's also, I think, a trick. And you've just had a situation of a collapse of the exchange rate which, when it rebounds, will make the foreign currency debt look a lot less onerous. And indeed, you mentioned 40 percent inflation. That's going to make the domestic debt less onerous. So I wonder if you would comment on those tricky aspects of coming to the conclusion that 71 percent is solvent and 90 percent is insolvent. And just to be clear, this is the end of our official time. Uh, that'll be the last question. Thanks. Um, well, first. Uh, the IMF has no tricks and uh, performs no tricks. Uh, this is a complicated calculus. I think your points make clear a number of the uh, special features of Ukraine's situation that indeed makes uh, the assessment of debt sustainability uh, complex. We, it is right that uh, roughly 20 percent of GDP of the debt is held by the central bank. And uh, you know, that is a mitigating factor uh, in the sense that uh, uh, it's within the public sector and the risk of uh, lack of rollover is not the same as when it's held by uh, private bondholders. Um, you, know, you mentioned other features. Um, we don't know what the uh, uh, evolution of the exchange rate will be. And we've made uh, an assumption, as we always have to do. Uh, when we look at other countries' experiences, we find uh, uh, some where stabilization leads to uh, uh, a renewed strengthening of the currency and others where it does not. It really depends, as I alluded to in my talk, on the monetary um, anchor and the strength of the monetary anchor. In any event, you know, on each of the points that you've mentioned, uh, barring the more political point, uh, we've had to make uh, technical assumptions, and that's how we've gotten to the uh, uh, debt sustainability analysis that we have and the conclusions we reached uh, with the three parameters, the 15 billion uh, flow needs, the 71 percent of GDP uh, uh, target, and the uh, 10 percent uh, of GDP cash flow uh, target, we think that those are uh, provide the right basis for um, the framework in which uh, Ukraine and its creditors will have these discussions. Okay. Words? Um, just, just a couple. On, uh, I think that in particular um, this point of offset has come up a lot, that uh, Russia owes Ukraine money and therefore why not withhold it. Um, the Russian bond actually has a term that says no offset and I think that it would be a lot to ask of the IMF to delve that deeply into the details uh, and make decisions about that. That's quite apart from the merits of a moratorium. I think more broadly, um, I think what we learn from Ukraine is that uh, debt is a business that's fraught with different kinds of uncertainty. And David mentioned one kind, and Bill alluded to it, the 
gray zone between illiquidity and insolvency, sustainable and unsustainable. But there's another one which we haven't discussed, and I think it's worth pondering, and that is how uh, insolvent is a country and how much relief does it need and how much does it depend on the assumptions uh, uh, on the table. And I think that perhaps that just counsels uh, against um, red lines and hard rules. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to Anna Gelpern for unique insights. Thank you to Anders Asland. Again, we will be releasing his new book, Ukraine, What Went Wrong and How to Fix It, on Friday, April 17th at breakfast with the Ukrainian finance and economics minister present, which will be an interesting complement to today's session. But of course, most of all, thank you to David Lipton and the IMF for coming out with so much substance and letting us engage you in this way as we often get to do. Very grateful. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.